Hey everybody, this is your girl Miss Marcy and thank you so much for tuning in to the Miss Marcy show. I am joined here today by a special guest. Um, he is an, an esteemed pornographer and author of the award-winning best-selling book, Obscene Thoughts, A Pornographer's Perspective on Sex, Love, and Dating. He's also the executive producer of the award-winning public health documentary, Risky Business, A Lick Inside America's Adult Film Industry. Everybody, please help me welcome Mr. David Pounder. Hi, David. How are you today? Well, thank you for having me on the show. How are you? I'm good, thank you. You're so welcome. Thanks for coming. So, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> now, as I mentioned, you know, you have your book and um, the, the the documentary, in which we will get more into that later. Um, but I, first, I want to start with um, first of all, where were you born and raised? Uh, I was actually born in England. Uh, my dad worked for Ford Motor Company and was on an assignment over there. And uh, I was born there, but I was only there for a few months. And then we were brought back to the Detroit area where I grew up. Uh, so I basically grew up in Michigan, uh, went off to college in Michigan State. And then when I graduated from Michigan State, I took a uh, job at General Electric, which then took me out of Michigan. And I kind of traveled around the country and other parts of the world for them. Um, and that's what kind of got me out of Michigan. Okay, all right. And and uh, where do you currently reside now? Now I'm in uh, Boca Raton, Florida, which is a suburb of Miami for people who don't really know Florida, but it's specifically between Fort Lauderdale and West Palm Beach. Okay, all right, cool. How's the weather there today? Oh, uh, it's always awesome. It uh, rains a lot, but it's good. It's a cool rain. It's like a like a monsoon type of rain. It's like it's fun rain. It's not like that wimpy rain. Right. <laughs> yeah, you guys always have the best weather. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Now, uh, the documentary Risky Business, which is a look inside the America's adult um, film industry, uh, I want to ask you, first of all, now you were also an actor, of course, you were a porn star, so how did you get into porn? I was actually, well, my girlfriend at the time got me a subscription to Hustler Magazine for my, uh, for my birthday, which was kind of cool of her, she was very progressive in that sense. <laughs> and in that, uh, in that magazine, one of the magazines that I got was a uh, an article about a swingers club where couples would go and just swap partners. And it was right, literally, uh, we were living in Irvine at the time, and it was in Costa Mesa, which was an adjacent city to Irvine. And I'm like, this can't be real. This is probably a joke. Blah blah blah. So I'm like, let me go find out if it's real. So um, I uh, I ended up uh, going to check it out. Um, just to see, and sure enough, um, you know, it was a it was a legitimate thing where people were going around and everybody was having sex with everybody. But I didn't actually do anything there. I ended up going to graduate school um, in Arizona, and then I kind of Google like swinger lifestyle and see if it was like you know just a California thing or a um, like in Arizona and everywhere else. And I found this club at the time called. Um, what it was called the one in, the one in California was called Panther Palace and there was one I forget it was a great club in uh in Phoenix when I was grad school on the weekends I would go out there and basically have sex with these couples um it was all straight stuff like the husband would watch his wife with me or it would be like a threesome where you know I was having sex with the wife while she was giving him a blowjob or, or vice versa and it was fun it was awesome like this is great like I love this <laughs> you know and uh when I graduated I, I took a job uh back in California with a bank, and I uh, ended up going back to this Panther Palace place. And while there, I met this couple. Uh, actually, I met this guy Maurice, uh, who I'm still friends with to this day. And Maurice introduced me to a couple there uh, who he knew. And uh, I basically had sex with the wife on the couch in front of everybody. And I just didn't care that I was being watched. I was just so happy to you know be having sex. And this guy comes up to me and he's like, "Have you ever thought about?" You know, performing in movies. And I said, "Well, you know, why me? There's so many guys here. Like, why are you asking me?" He's like, "Well, you know, you're young, you're decently attractive." He's like, "You know, um, most people can't perform with a, with an audience. You know, they have to." I didn't know kind of the protocol for all these different clubs, and like, I guess apparently, like, um, you know, everybody was getting private rooms at this particular club. Um, so I was like, "I don't care if I'm being watched. Like, I'll totally do it." You know, my concern was more that I wouldn't be able to. Because I didn't know anything about editing, you know, so I just thought that I'd have to go like 45 minutes without stopping with this hot girl and like 
go to town and like I'm like how am I what if I have to come it's like I'm thinking like you know what I mean like how am I gonna like right but uh, anyway so he's like well it doesn't matter the first time you just play a husband like the reason that these porn scouts are at the swing club is they were trying to scout for real couples for this uh, video series they were shooting for wildlife video called Screw My Wife Please <laughs> and they were like on number 13 or something you know it's a, how porn works it's like Hot Girls Volume 1 and then you know Hot Girls Volume 57 right so they were like on number 12 or 13 and um, they wanted to find couples you know where, where the couples would watch their wife with a real porn guy so they, they basically just wanted me to get started to like pretend I was a husband and they would basically hire a porn girl like a real porn girl to play my wife and then I would get excited watching her with another guy. That's like my acting role. So it's kind of a non-sex setup. So I get down there, and um, and I think what they're trying to do is to see, you know, can I get a, an erection on camera with the people around mm-hmm. before they try to use me, you know? Um, and the, when I get there, the girl liked me, and she's like, hey, can I have sex with him too? Like, just for fun. And the director says to me, are you tested? I'm like, I mean, I like test. He's like, do you have an STD test? I'm like, oh, my last doctor's appointment was like six months ago. He's like, no, no, you have to go to this special porn lab and get these tests. So I didn't get to have sex with this gorgeous girl that wanted that sex with me. So that sucks. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm playing the husband and I'm watching her, my fake wife, you know, have sex. And then I just start networking with everybody on the set. I'm like, how'd you get in the pool? What do you do? What's your role? You know, you tell me, blah, blah, blah. And just networking. And then I, you know, people would tell me about these agents and, you know, how it worked. And I basically went home and I called the agent. And I'm like, hey, you know, so-and-so, director so-and-so from the shoot told me I guess I have to call you because he wants to use me in a movie which is total BS I just made it up so that I could get get in with the agency <laughs> this guy was going to use me and they're like oh yeah sure come on down you know, we'll take your photo you know they take a Polaroid and they put you this is before all the digital photography you know they, they take a Polaroid they put you in this talent book and the producers would come look through the book and then hire people based on that so uh, then I got selected for this well then I met this guy Chase because um, uh, you know Maurice the guy that kind of Introduced mm-hmm. with Adam, who was a who was scouting for porn, uh, basically told me about this other thing that Adam was doing called the bukkake. It was like fifty guys, and they all basically just you know self stimulate themselves and then you know ejaculate on the girl's face. Um, and I'm like, I'll check it out. I'll see what it's all about. You know, and when I show up, I met this guy Chase, who's this big, big black guy. He looks like Shrek, but he's black. I call him Black Shrek to this day. And he's like the coolest guy. He's so he's so he's just so outgoing and personable. Like he's he's awesome and. Uh, he became like my best friend, basically, and like he he basically knew everybody in the business. And he promoted me to everyone. He's like, check out this new white guy. And we used to joke. I was like Eminem, and he was Dr. Dre. And, like, he was like the trick <laughs> guy to try to promote me to all the producers and stuff. And it worked. Like you know, people started trying me, and then I was able to. Uh, the first time I completely failed because I didn't realize that um, you could take breaks. So I saw I, I basically masturbated right before the scene, so that I, <laughs> thinking that I could last longer. Like if I if I masturbated right away, then the second, the second round, you know, I would last longer. But the problem was that I didn't have any erection whatsoever in the second round because I had just right. And it basically ruined my my prospects for that. And uh, I, I confessed to the producer, I'm like, look, or you know, the director, I'm like, look, I was, you know, the, he knew because I was asking, like, oh, what if I have to stop? What if I have to stop? And I want to hold everybody up. He's like, dude, just shut up, just relax, just break. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm not gonna call break and have like all these camera guys and all these talent and all the other scenes behind me and the location and everybody holding up. I don't want to be the the cog. I don't or the uh, what do they call it? The bottleneck. Right. I want someone else to be the bottleneck, not because of my issues. So I thought it would make me look bad. And of course, not having interaction at all made me look worse. But you know, he ended up giving me another chance. Put me with two girls and. Uh, the, you know, slightly better. I mean, I, I, I got through that, and then basically um, I started honing my skill. I figured out how much I needed to eat, you know, before a shoe, like what made me, you know, perform better. And I couldn't eat a big meal. Yeah, I, can't, I can't go to McDonald's and have a quarter pound of a cheese salad. You know, go do a shoe. You know, I have to go have like a bottle of water and some M&Ms and like smoothies. Mm. You know, that'll, that won't bog me down. And then you kind of just, you know, you learn. It's like anything else. I mean, if you start playing tennis, you know, you're going to hit the ball in the net a couple of times, and the more you play, the better you get. And then, you know, after a couple, first year or two, then you started performing consistently. And, and, you know, they have safeguards in place. I mean, you're not going to be a brand new guy and get your first shoot working for Hustler or Vivid. It's like, you're going to work for these smaller companies and build a name and meet other girls who like working with you, and those girls will request you with the bigger companies. And, you know, like, and then you build kind of a reputation. And then, um, so yeah, I was 
working consistently after, you know, I was only doing it part time when I started because I was still working at the bank. Mm-hmm. And then when I had enough work, I just quit the bank. I'm like, what's the point, you know? And then I just was doing the porn, and then I started directing and producing, and then all the free content came out. You know, I'm not, nobody pays for porn anymore. No. To. So now that nobody pays, it's like there's it's not worth working five times as hard to make half as much so I just set it to get out and then I went to the uh, Indiana University to start a PhD realized I hated the cold weather even though I grew up in Michigan I guess I just forgot about it I live in California <laughs> right then I was running out my condo in Irvine so I couldn't go anywhere so I went, came down to Miami hung out in Miami moved back to California realized California is colder than Miami because remember I went I went California Indiana so I went warm cold warm right so warm is warm there's no difference between you know Florida and California when I got back to California, I'm like, man, it's cold here. It's like 65, you know, like, it's not 75, like Miami. So I uh, ended up selling my condo there. Um, and then moving back to uh, back to Florida, uh, you know, and uh, now I have the book and the document. I've been kind of doing these, like, mainstream projects about pornography. So they're kind of like, you know, mainstream mm-hmm. G, PG related projects you know, about, you know, like my book is about human sexuality, the documentary is a public health documentary about the adult film industry, um, so they're mainstream audiences, but just about, about more, and I will we'll eventually finish my PhD that I barely started, uh, but I'll do it in a place with a warm climate, like <laughs> Texas, or, you know, go back to Southern California, Santa Barbara, or something, and be at least relatively warm. Because they don't have any good programs here in South Florida for evolutionary psychology, which is what I want to get into. Oh, okay. All right. Now, you mentioned that uh, people don't pay for porn anymore, which is true. So, I know at one point the porn industry was a billion-dollar industry. Is that still the same, being that people don't really pay for porn anymore? Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think so. But, I mean, the thing is, is you know, the analogy I use is bottled water. Like, imagine... You know how like you just go to your sink and you turn on water and you get it basically for free and mm-hmm. then your water bill is like thirty bucks a month, but you get tons of water, right? Like, imagine there's no water system. So if you want to, you know, flush your toilet, you got to fill it up with bottled water. If you want to take a shower, you got to dump a bunch of bottled water on you. If you want to do cooking or, or even wash your clothes, all bottled water, right? Right. You're going to be selling a lot of bottled water. I mean, the bottled water industry is going to be kicking butt, right? Right. Then all of a sudden, the tube sites come in, which is basically or the torrent sites which is basically the, the, the city coming in and saying, we're going to put a municipal water system in and everybody gets water for dirt cheap, right? So now everybody's using water to flush the toilet and water to take a shower and water to do their, their dishes and laundry. Uh, and a lot of people drink from the faucet, but there are still people who buy bottled water. Mm-hmm, but the right. percentage of people who buy bottled water now, even though people still buy bottled water, compared to when you had to buy it for everything to meet a basic need, is it just pales in comparison. You're talking one... One thousandth or one one hundred thousandth um, of a percent. So, you know, I've always argued that, that males, particularly, which is the primary, uh, you know, market for porn, um, that, that sexual sexuality and sexual variety is a basic need. I mean, it's not like you know, you hear women all the time say, "Oh, I went two or three years without having sex. Or I got divorced. I took a break." You know, you'll never hear that from a guy. You'll never hear a guy say, "I didn't have sex for two years." I mean, right. if a guy doesn't have sex in six months, he hires a prostitute or he gets an escort. You know, he goes to a strip club and pays the girl to give him a blowjob. Like, it's it's a it's like an oil change for us. It's that women, it's very different. Um, so, in a sense, it's like that bottled water analogy. Guys had to spend the money if they couldn't get have sex in a, in a regular social environment of going out to bars or clubs or however they interact with women. They would have to basically masturbate to porn and you know, you know get a subscription to a website or a magazine or something. Uh, and then once all that became free, people were like screw this. I'm not going to pay 30 bucks a month if I can just get it for free here. So a lot of producers, I'd say probably 90% of the producers just got out of the business. They're like, it's just not worth it anymore. Like, what's the point? You know, it's mm. like, remember VHS tapes? I mean, nobody, yes. nobody makes those anymore. You say, well, why'd you get out of the VHS business? Like, well, nobody bought them. Right. You know, DVD. And then uh, today, nobody's making, I mean, they still have DVDs, but nobody's making them anymore because everybody's streaming a video. Like, yes. You know, on Prime and Netflix, like, everything's moving towards streaming and on demand that there's no reason to be in the DVD business. And the same thing with porn. And even today, I mean, sexuality is so mainstream that, uh, you know, couples today, I mean, if I had a girlfriend right now and she's like, hey, let's take pictures of us having sex, I'd be like, yeah, let's do it. Video, video, I don't care. You know, like, who cares, right? And then let's say we break up and she gets pissed off at me and, like, post the photos or, or vice versa. Like, there's so much stuff. Everybody has a sex tape. You know, celebrities have a sex tape. Like, nobody cares. Like, people... Right. Uh, 
since they wanted to be upset. So it's, it's like a commodity now. So there's you can't really charge a premium um, for sexuality products. So now what I'm trying to do myself is get the political system more accepting of, of sexuality. Like, for example, you know, in, in real life, people go to strip clubs, even though it's illegal, and they pay girls to have blowjobs and have sex in the back room. But they can go to jail for that. I don't think they should be able to go to jail for that. So mm-hmm. where does that change with the political process? So this documentary, in a sense, is kind of a way to tell people that they shouldn't, you know, like that teachers and cops and public officials shouldn't be fired just because they made a porn video 20 years ago. Or even if they're currently making a porn video today, it's irrelevant. How, mm-hmm. is, how is the fact that you shot a porn video on the weekend any different than you opened a bar and you're serving alcohol on the weekend? These are both things that kids are not able to lawfully consume and if anything the burden on alcohol should be higher because you got to be 21 to drink alcohol but only 18 to consume or star in pornography so why are we firing teachers or cops who once upon a time made a porn video but we're not firing similarly those people who uh you know produced alcohol or owned a bar or or a tobacco shop or anything else that you know kids can't lawfully uh consume so yeah this raising awareness on those issues um, you know and I, I think the legalized prostitution is kind of far away uh, but you know most other developed nations have lawful prostitution Germany the Netherlands I and mean, you know Australia like it's, it's usually more sort of religious uh, societies and the US just happens to be one of the more religious developed societies and I think that's why it's not legal here at least not yet mm-hmm. right all right. All right, David. And what I'm going to do is we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. And when we come back um, to all of our listeners, we're going to be back with more David Pounder. And stay tuned. Join the club that gives you stuff. Hey, thanks. Radio loyalty. Here's how it works. Just click on the radio loyalty banner right now and sign up. Then you keep on listening like you already do. But now you earn points. Those points add up and you can trade them in for stuff in the radio loyalty store. Earn more points by sharing your station with friends on Facebook and Twitter, answering surveys, and by using the apps in the new players app store. Pretty simple, right? Radio loyalty. Click that banner to join now. All right, everybody. We are back. And if you are just now tuning in, we are speaking with David Pounder, the esteemed pornographer and author of the award-winning best-selling book, Obscene Thoughts, A Pornographer's Perspective on Sex, Love, and Dating. Now, uh, David, before we went to commercial, I wanted to ask you, so in your documentary, um, Risky Business, the, let me say, make sure I say the whole title, in your documentary, Risky Business, A Look Inside America's Adult Film Industry, so a person would not see uh, like any like acts. There is pretty. This is pretty much from a political standpoint, right? Yeah, I mean the documentary has you know top nudity basically, like you know like any other movie. You know it has shows breasts and things like that, but there's no graphic depictions of sex. I mean I think there's like a soft core thing where you you know you you see that people are having sex, but there's no you don't see any penetration or anything. That's right. like one small segment, but it's overwhelmingly. I mean. It, it, it's not a titillating documentary. I mean, the the target market for the documentary is really more attorneys, you know, people who are interested mm-hmm. in constitutional law, um, you know, public health officials that are interested in community health and epidemiology. Um, and um, I would say uh, you got the legal, you got the public health, you got the maybe like civil rights people that are interested in anti discrimination law. Um, cool. you know, that's really kind of who the target market is, and psychologists that are interested in why people come into porn. Uh, you know, uh, it's really more of an NPR crowd. Like right. Just kind of educated, progressive intellectuals that want an understanding of the inner workings of the business and the legal questions and things along those lines. So I wouldn't recommend it. You know, if you're somebody who watches a lot of porn and you're just like, oh, I want to see, you know, my favorite stars talking <laughs> about porn, like, it's not so much that. It's more about saying, you know, should an employer be able to uh, fire someone because of a prior involvement in the adult film industry? What are the legal issues surrounding that? You know, like, should they mandate should condom use be mandated in adult films? And how do you balance that public health uh, mandate against the sort of free speech uh, freedoms that we have, you know, for the producer to produce what they want? You know, um, how do people come into the business? You know, what are their experiences after they leave the business, their relationships, their jobs, um, things along those lines. So it's really, I mean, it's a great, I mean, you know, if you, if you watch porn and you're interested in just, you know, in, in how the industry works, it's still worth watching. But don't, don't expect to, you know, take out a bottle of lube you know, <laughs> to the documentary. It's just, 
you're going to be disappointed, you know, right. if you, uh, you know, if you're interested in, in, you know, if you're interested in, like, TED Talks and Intelligence Squared debates and things like that, um, or if you attend university lectures and things like that, then so it's going to appeal to you if you're interested in the topic. Right. No, and no, I think this is actually good because it takes the educational approach, you know. So it's good to kind of get some backstory on the industry. Right. Yeah. So now, is it like a normal eight-hour shift doing porn? Like, is that? No. No, no, no. Like, I mean, if you're a performer, they call it. I mean, basically, when I was performing, you have an agent, and the agent will call you up and say, hey, I have a shoot for you on Thursday at you know, 6 with this girl, this is the type of scene, it's a boy girl, boy boy girl, boy girl girl, boy girl anal, like I don't do anal, but just you know, the type of things that they might, that they might uh, do, and they tell you the rate, you know, and all that kind of stuff, and you say, do you want to do it? And I might say, no, I don't, I'm not really into her, I don't want to work with her, is there somebody else I can work with, or I don't really like that director, he's a bad mm. ass, I don't work with her, oh, the rate's too low, you know, my rate's higher for that, or, you know, or whatever, like, is there dialogue, is there not dialogue, but no, as an actor, there's really what's called feature shoots and gonzo shoots and feature shoots are like the big productions like Wicked Pictures and uh, Vivid Video at the time VCA Pictures and oftentimes the Hustler does some of this and you know there's dialogue you show up you memorize lines and then maybe, maybe your sex scene is way later in the day but you have to show up early to do the dialogue scenes with the other mm-hmm. people that are other scenes to link everything together and that, that usually pays more because you're there longer and then there's a gonzo shoot where you show up it's literally just for that scene like most of the internet stuff you watch you know, there's, there's a website called like say Bikini Banger and you gotta watch a different girl in the bikini and you literally just show up and there's the girl in the bikini there's, there's no there's no linking of the prior scene or the next scene it's there's standalone scenes that target a, a niche in this case bikinis uh, but you literally show up throw in the paperwork do your scene and leave you can be in and out in as low as two hours uh, as long as five hours and more likely three or four hours uh, for all the production stills and the video and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, it's I mean, for what it is, I mean, you know, if you're a decent performing guy, you'll make four six hundred dollars, you know, to be on set for like four hours. It's mm-hmm. like a hundred bucks an hour to have sex with hot girls and like hang out. You know, like <laughs> it's kind of cool. You know, now if you're on the if you're on the production side and you're like a, a producer, then you're probably going to be working eight hours or longer, 10, 12 hours on the day you're shooting. Right. Um, okay, we're shooting six scenes, you know, for this new movie. Because you're renting the location, you know, so you're renting the house, you want to get there early, get set up uh, so for everyone there. And then when they're all done, you got to clean up the house. And, you know, you're trying to get all your, you're trying to, to sort of leverage the uh, the cost of the house. If you're going to rent a house, you know, you might as well, you rent a house for like a half a day or the whole day. It's like, well, you know, it's like, you know, let's say, you know, 700 for half a day or 1,000 for the whole day, you might as well get it for the whole day and shoot twice as many scenes if you can, you know. Um, right. So it's it's a. I mean, I loved it. I love porn. Like, I mean, I only got out of it because it's like, uh, well, there's two reasons I got out of it. One was, you know, all the uh, tube and torrent sites that were killing the profitability, and I'm like, it's just too expensive to challenge that legally. And there's always going to be people pirating. You know, it's not like a mainstream movie where you, you spend thirty million dollars and you can have a two million dollar budget just to prevent piracy and hire people to constantly police the internet. Where when you know we we making a scene for two thousand dollars. I mean sending one cease and desist letter could be basically, you know, uh, a tenth of the production cost for the whole scene to send one cease and desist letter. So it's, um, it wasn't there. The other, the other issue for me as a performer was just the fact that there was a lot of, um, I don't have anything against gay people whatsoever, but when you look at HIV distribution and sort of these lethal STD things, it's always in what they call MSN populations, men mm-hmm. who have sex with men. And you started seeing a lot of this crossover, a lot of these gay performers were coming over to the straight side uh, and having sex with the girls, and that was just way too sweepy for me. But, uh, again, not because they're gay, but because of the the double dipping, the epidemiology behind the risk factors. I mean, like in porn, you get tested every thirty days. I think they they made it fifteen days now, but still, mm-hmm. I mean, if I do, if I get tested today and the girl gets tested today, and we do a shoot tomorrow, and I'm negative, she's negative, we do our shoot, unprotected sex. The next day, she does a scene with a gay, with a gay guy who's crossover into the straight side. And he got HIV from his boyfriend because he was out partying or escorting with some gay guy. But he has HIV. It's like and then he has sex with the girl the next day. She's much more likely to get it. Because what people don't understand is when you have HIV, your infectious, your infectability is, is the most highest immediately when you get it. Mm-hmm. Your body hasn't built up the antibodies and stuff to it. So by the time another 13 days rolls around, 
know, that might be too late, you know, and I don't want to sit there and, and increase my risk any more than I need to. I mean, I'm already increasing risk in the sense that I'm increasing partners, but by not, by not engaging in anal sex, in, in other words, you know, HIV doesn't just target you because you're gay. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you're gay. Right. You're gay. I mean, it targets the behavior and gay men have anal sex, right? So when you look at a lot of the HIV distribution in the straight population, it's mainly because of anal sex transmission. So I, I, I don't do the anal, not only because I'm not into it, but just because it's also with women, also because um, it's just a higher prevalence of getting certain types of hepatitis or HIV, etc. So now if you have gay guys that are coming in doing straight scenes, you know, they're just much more likely to, to infect women. And that's what you started seeing. You saw a lot of these HIV things in porn, and there was always, you know, a gay guy that crossed mm. over, you know, that came over. They were shooting anal seeds in Brazil with tranny prostitutes. It just, it just got all crazy. You know, like, I'm just right. a vanilla, happy guy that wants to just depict sex in the fun, collegiate kind of way. And uh, it was great. I did that for, like, 10 years, you know. Right, you can do without you can do without all the double dipping. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, it was never hard for me to have sex like in my regular life. So, right. <clears throat> to me, it's like I don't need to be in porn. I can just do it through swinging or just through just meeting girls in general. And uh, you know, I feel like like porn is already sort of pervasive in culture. It's now now the focus is really to get it more politically accepted. Right. Well, in the same way that now we have tolerance for sexual breath, I would call it, whether you like having sex with men, women, or anything in between, now we need to start accepting sexual depth. Say, okay, I only like women or I only like men, but they shouldn't be, I shouldn't be treated differently because I want to have sex with a thousand women versus two women, mm -hmm. or a thousand men versus two men, right? Um, and I think you're starting to see that. And I think as more and more people become swingers or polyamorous, mm -hmm. it's going to be more difficult. So you're going to start seeing a lot more legal challenges to discrimination based on that. There was, there was a guy... He was a town manager in West Florida. I think his name was Scott Janky. And he got fired because he married a porn girl. His wife happened to make a porn movie. Wow. He fired him. You know, he didn't do anything. He, he was just lawfully married to a girl in a lawful profession. And the town hall, the city hall, voted to fire him from his city manager position, public position, merely for that reason. Wow. Had to challenge it. Had he challenged it legally, he would have probably won on constitutional grounds. You know, there was a guy, Sean Loftus, he was a substitute teacher in Miami. They found out he used to, he, he had done some gay porn. They fired him, but he actually mm. fought and challenged it to the Florida Education Practices Commission. And when he challenged it, they said, you can't fire this guy. He's not a threat to children. He, doesn't, he hasn't done anything illegal. There's no reason he can't be a teacher. He hasn't done anything wrong. You're, like, criminalizing him for doing nothing wrong. So usually when these things are challenged, um, they survive. And there was, there was a girl named Anna Land in Michigan who was a teacher and she went to like the mall and like made some kind of sexually provocative pose on a mannequin and pretended she was giving, I don't know, something. <laughs> Taking with her friend's personal photo and her friend sent it to a friend who sent it to a friend and it got to like a school parent and the parent complained to the school and the school fired her saying she set a bad role model example of morality or some retarded subjective claim, you know. And she challenged it, lost at the lower court in Michigan and then won on the appeals court um, in Michigan, and I think the Supreme Court denied to hear it, um, and so she prevailed. So the more the more people challenge sexual discrimination uh, or discrimination based on their sexual practices or sexual orientation, I think the stronger the case law will become, uh, and then you'll start seeing less and less people, companies, etc., uh, discriminating as a result. Right now, in in any of the um, you know any of the movies or uh, what have you did any of the actors ever make any connections and like get together beyond the set yeah absolutely sure i mean some of my closest friends when i was in the business i'd hang out with like, like juliana kincaid mm -hmm. she was one of my best friends we used to hang out all the time i'd go and chill with her at her place she'd come over we'd hang out um yeah i mean of course and, no uh, well i'm sorry no i mean like get together get married and have a family and stuff like that oh um yeah some do but you know i tell people that can't have, I just don't think relationships work when everybody's off screwing everybody. <laughs> and even like, even in like, even in the, even in the swinger world, like you see, the analogy I use is this, men do not value monogamy. Women do. Mm -hmm. And unless they've been, unless they have a past history of sexual abuse or emotional abuse that will, for different psychological reasons, cause them to act more like men. But assuming that there's no trauma in a man and a woman's life, a man values sexual variety. It's his lucky day if he, if he goes and gets laid that day, right? Well, girl, no, I mean, you know as a woman that if you want to get laid, like, if I said to you, 
I'll give you a million dollars if you can find some guy that you don't know to have sex with you in the next hour. Your job is to go out, find somebody that will have sex with you in the next hour, um, and I'll give you a million dollars. You know as a woman that you can do that with no problem whatsoever. Right. You find a willing guy. You throw that back to me as a guy who understands women very well and is tall and attractive and all this kind of stuff, and I would never take that bet. There is no way I can find a girl that will have sex with me in the next hour that I don't already know and that I'm not willing to pay. And that talks about the differences between sexual sexual uh, psychology of men versus women. So what happens is you have these guys that basically tell women they want to be monogamous so that they can get into relationships and ultimately marry them. But they don't. They, most of these guys end up cheating, um, and they just they just are monogamous because the girl wants to be monogamous. And, and when you go to the swinger lifestyle where everybody's having sex with everybody, the women are like. You know they, they're they're kind of reluctantly there. They're there because he wants to be there. The husband wants to be there. Very very rarely, if at all, where I meet a couple where the husband's like, "Hey, my wife wanted to do this. I have no interest. I'm just here for her." You know, so she can have sex with all these guys. Like, I've never seen that in 12 years of swinging. You know, so what happens is is I almost feel like the best model is where. A man and a woman are in a perceived monogamous relationship where the guy is telling the woman he's monogamous and she believes he's monogamous. And then he's off cheating uh, because everybody's having their needs met. If you tell the girl well, as rational as you want to be, and this is how men are, here's all the data to support it, you can easily make that case. Women may understand it intellectually, but they'll never accept it. And they'll believe the guy who says that he's faithful. Mm -hmm. and, and for men, you can, con you, know, you can convince girls all day long that they shouldn't care, they're always going to care, and you can convince men all day long not to cheat, and they will. You know, like, I can make an argument to you that, you know, there's really no reason that you need to eat anything other than salad and a multivitamin. You can survive on that. Water or salad, yeah, you could survive on that, right? But why? Right. <laughs> right? Like, like, why? Like, there's no reason, like, guys don't want monogamy. We have no, we have no interest in that. Like, and there's plenty of research, I mean, and if you read my book, I mean, this will get into all that, but... Uh, by the way, the book, Obscene Thoughts, A Pornographer's Perspective on Sex, Love, and Dating, you can go to ObsceneThoughts.com and watch interviews like this, uh, read the reviews, all that kind of stuff. And the documentary's website is RiskyBusinessTheMovie.com, RiskyBusinessTheMovie.com, where you can watch the trailer, and then if you want to watch the movie, it's like four bucks or something that's cheap. Yeah, I actually I actually watched the trailer and I'm interested and I want to watch more, so I'm going to go back and, and look that up and, and watch the whole thing. I hope you do. I need the four dollars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let me ask you. So, who is typically the highest paid in in porn uh, as a ter in terms of sex and race? Uh, women, well, race doesn't really matter. It's mm -hmm. really women. I mean, women make women. about twice what the men make. So if you're if you're a girl and you're making twelve hundred on a shoot, the girl, the guy's probably making six. If you're mm -hmm. making six hundred on a shoot as a girl, the guy's probably making three. Um, I don't see any pay differences in, in race. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there's hot Asian girls, hot black girls, hot white girls. Right. They all get paid the same. I mean, there's ugly white girls, ugly black girls, ugly Asian girls. They all get paid the same kind of lower rate. Um, you know, there's a wicked girl named Kaylani Lee. Uh, she's a hot Asian girl. She gets, you know, great rates, as does whoever the hot white girl is today and the hot black girl. Uh, you know, so it just depends. I mean, I think... I think overwhelmingly men have a preference for women who have a, a waist hip ratio of 0.68 to 0.72, mm -hmm. um, and irrespective of race, and they have a preference for long, full hair and curvy women, you know, curvy like having breasts and uh, butt and things like that, and the girls that are able to exude that are the ones that are going to get more. Now, there may be correlations amongst race, in mm -hmm. the sense that you're going to find more thin women amongst white and Asians, but you're going to find more curvy women amongst blacks and Latinos. Right. So if you, you know, if you just happen to be that black girl that's naturally curvy, um, but you just also happen to be fit and have long, kind of beautiful, you know, Vanessa Williams hair, you're going to do better than if you have the traditional, say, African American hair. And if you're a white girl and you're thin, you'll do fine. But if you have a little black curviness going to you, like a little junk in the trunk, you know, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> then you're going to get a better rate. So, you know, just look at the girls who are the top paid girls in the board, and they usually have a point, point 0.7 waist hip ratio. They have you know, some curves to that. They don't have to have size D boobs, but they, they don't have A's. Right. Uh, they, they, they have, they have uh, curves and a, a little bubble butt, but they don't have a huge, you know, ghetto booty, if you will. You know, like it's... it's <laughs> 
I think it's just in line with what what, what men value. I mean, he's right. Let's trying to create a product that men respond to. Right. You know? Now, yeah. me personally, I, I just I, I never thought that porn would be something I could do if I had a family, like if I had a husband and stuff. Because it's like, okay, you're at work sucking dick, and then you're going home sucking dick. I mean, it, it just seemed like it's just a lot. You know what I mean? <laughs> Oh, sure, but it's like anything else. I mean, if you're a if you're a builder and you're off building houses all day, you come home. You don't want to build houses. You know I mean, <laughs> right. I'm just building houses all day. I don't want to build any houses. Let's just relax, you know. Like, and even me, I mean, having been with you know over a thousand girls, it's like even girls I date today, it's like they. I can't. I can't think of one girl that hasn't complained that I don't have enough sex with her. Wow. Um, it's kind of over the sex thing. I mean, I like to have sex right away. If I meet a new girl, the novelty. I want to have sex with her right away. I to the point where I'm just impatient. I'm like, listen, I don't even tell girls. I'm like. I, if you're one of these girls that has to wait a couple of days before sex, I'm just not interested. I don't expect you to have sex with me the first day, but like, hang out, we'll go out, we'll go have some Starbucks, we'll go for a walk, and you know, we'll get to know each other. And at the end of the day, if you like me, have sex with me. If you don't, then don't be surprised if I don't call you because you shouldn't care. In other words, if you like me, have sex with me. Like, I kind of say that. Wow. And, and women are surprisingly receptive to that, and they do. And then what happens is we start hanging out, and we hang out, and then I get to know them more and more, and then they basically go from becoming sex, sex objects initially to people, if that makes any sense. Uh -huh. And then like, now she's like this cool chick that I know. I'm like, wow, this girl's really cool. And the interest becomes less sexual. It becomes more companionship. It becomes, wow, I really like this girl. I want to I go to her house and cuddle and go for a walk and watch a movie together and eat dinner. Like, sex is like sex. Like, that's, I don't do that with a girlfriend. I do that with like a random stranger, you know, like... Like, that's, that's, I think, how a lot of the male mind is wired. I mean, I think a lot of males don't have the, the opportunity that a lot of other people might have. Um, I think it's all opportunity-based. I mean, you look at a guy like George Clooney or, you know, Denzel, or like some, some big actor or, you know, sports teams, quarterbacks, things like that. Like, you know, these guys get laid all the time. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, they, they value the variety. Now, if you're the, the mechanic or the guy who works at McDonald's, you don't have a lot of opportunities, so you're with your girlfriend, and you have sex with your girlfriend because she's the only person available to have sex with you. <laughs> if you had all these other people available, your girlfriend would be your last choice. Not because you don't love her, it has nothing right. to do with that, it's just because it's novelty. It's something right. new. If you eat at the same restaurant every day, you have the opportunity to go somewhere else, most people would take that opportunity. I don't, I don't see anything wrong with that. Right. You know? And I want to go to a break real quick, David, real quick, and because um, I, I definitely want to come back and I want to elaborate more on what you just said because I have a whole lot to say about that. So, uh, for all our listeners, uh, stay tuned. We'll be more. We'll be back with more Dave Pounder. Free stuff for you just for listening to this station. Yo, we got your attention? Here's how it works. You click on the radio loyalty banner right now and sign up. Then you keep on listening like you already do. But now you earn points. Those points add up, and you can trade them in for cool stuff in the radio loyalty store. Earn more points by sharing your station with friends on Facebook and Twitter, answering surveys, and by using the apps in the new player's app store. Pretty simple. Free stuff just for doing what you already do. Radio loyalty. Click the banner to join now. All right, everybody. We are back, and if you are just tuning in, I am talking with a uh, mr dave pounder and um david before we went to a break you said some things i really want to elaborate on okay about the when you first meet a woman and you want to have sex with her immediately that actually ties back to something i always say i say the latest trend is it seems that people want to have sex first and get to know each other later yep and <laughs> so, well, well here's what's happening is you got to remember that men and women have different sexual strategies that, that they prefer and you I talk about this in the book of Seen Thoughts uh, back in the day before the internet people lived in small communities they didn't have cell phones I mean your social circle was basically where you work in your immediate community you didn't know people you, know, you couldn't get on like match.com and meet somebody 40 miles away because there was no internet uh, so what happened is your social reputation mattered. If you were the guy who was just trying to have sex with everybody, they would know immediately and then you'd be shunned in your social circle and you have no dates. So you basically had to court the woman. You had to basically go, let me take you out. Are you? It was all about the girl. Are you ready now? Oh, great. You know, like it was all the girl's thing. Now it's completely different. Now you're like, as a guy, you can date anywhere in the world. I mean, you can go find a girl in Asia and bring her over here. You know, like you could go on Match. You can go on, you know, if you like younger girls, older girls, whatever you like, there's a dating site for you. You know, there's Asian mm -hmm. Friend Finder. There's Adult Friend Finder. There's... There's Christian mingle, right? Whatever you want. Like yeah. Nothing. And and the thing is, is because men value sexual variety. Now women are the ones that have. We're, we're, we're back in the day, men didn't want to go on five dates 
or ten dates or wait a month or, or spend all this money on dinner or roses or buy all these gifts and maybe get laid, right? But they had to. That, that was, that, they had no choice. Otherwise, there's a million other guys that'll do it. Now, it's changed. If the girl isn't willing to have sex right away, guys like myself included, I'm like, well, all right, good luck. <laughs> Somebody else that will, you know, and I, and I go out with them. Um, you know, so it's... Um, yeah, I, I don't think girls like it any more than guys liked having to invest all this money and time without a certain outcome back in the day when they didn't have a choice. So it's really a market demand thing. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, it's like, you know, women don't want to just have sex and that's the end of it. Like, I think women are okay with the with the quick sex thing as long as they know that there's going to be more to it than just that. Right. So I'll, I'll talk to a girl on the phone and I'll say, listen, Let's just keep talking until you're comfortable meeting. Because if she's not in front of me, if I'm not looking at her boobs and looking at her ass, looking at how pretty she is, like, I, it's a voice. I don't feel the need to have sex with a voice. Mm -hmm. You might as well be a guy. I don't care. Like, I'm just chatting about life and politics and whatever. And if she decides after talking for a couple phone calls or hours or whatever that she wants to meet, when we actually meet, that's really like our fifth date. You know what I mean? Because we've already had four hour long conversations. Right. <laughs> Now, but she's still new to me. She's still novel. I show up and I'm like, wow, she's hot. Look at her boobs, right? Because <laughs> I'm there now, right? And like, now we have a great conversation. I can come home and have sex with her. And I, I don't have that frustration that I mm -hmm. would have had had I met her on a first date and she looked all hot. Now I have to go home and masturbate because I don't have an outlet. Right. right. So if I know that, the re that a new restaurant opened up in town and they have food that I like or food I'm attracted to, right? I don't want to go there, have them put chicken fettuccine Alfredo on my face, and don't tell me I can't eat it. They want to get to know me more. Come back tomorrow. Maybe I can eat it. I'm like, if you're not going to feed me, then let's talk franchise. Because you know, women ultimately want to be made courting and franchise. So if you're the restaurant, it's the girl. If you want me to franchise you, and you're not going to feed me, I'd rather just talk about the business details on the phone. What's the menu? What's the pricing? What's the franchise fee? Do all that on the phone. You know, that's all the politics, common music, etc. But I'm not going to drive my ass to the restaurant and have fettuccine in front of my face or whatever your food preference is <laughs> if I'm not going to be allowed to eat it. Or at least give me the complimentary bread and olive oil. Right. Or give me the chips and salsa, which is like a blowjob or a hand. Or give me some kind of nourishment that if I'm not going to get the chicken fettuccine alfredo, then at least I don't have to be hungry. Give right. me bread. I mean, I'd rather have the alfredo than the bread, but I'll take it. Give me chips and salsa. I'd rather have the alfredo, but at least I've been eating enough chips and salsa then I don't really need the Alfredo because cause I've eaten enough chips and salsa. Um, which is, again, I tell girls this. If you go out with a guy and you don't want to have sex with him, don't end it and then have him not call you and don't have sex with him and feel bad. Tell him, you know what I think is hot? I love watching men masturbate. Will you jerk off for me? And then he does the jerking off. She just watches. She's done nothing. He comes. He's happy. He's, sati he's satiated. Now, if she all of a sudden says, wow, that's super hot. I want to have sex. He's like, I can't. I just can't. you got to wait. Twenty minutes, right? Know? Like, like so, and it kind of helps her get more prepped for a future sexual encounter. But the point is, is everybody wins. I just mm -hmm. think people may feel a certain level of awkwardness in asking for that. But it's it's very acceptable to say, "I'm sorry, sir, your table won't be ready for three days at the restaurant. Can I offer you some bread to tie you over?" <laughs> That's all it is. You know what I mean? Than letting the guy starve or having him go home frustrated and say, "I don't want to go back to that restaurant. I waited there for an hour or two and they didn't seat me." I don't want to go back and risk that again. Right. But, well, you make that's what it goes down to. Yeah, you make some very interesting points, and, and that's uh, some really good points, actually, which this also ushers us into your book, um, Obscene Thoughts, A Pornographer's Perspective on Sex, Love, and Dating. So where do you see the future of dating relationships and courtships? We might already kind of answer that. Well, there was a funny thing I saw. It said how dating has changed. It said 1995 and like 2015. In 1995, there was a guy on his knee holding a, a bottle of wine and some roses at a girl's feet, and he was dressed in a tux or something. And in 2015, there's a girl on her knees giving yes. her a blowjob, and he's like dressed in like <laughs> I saw that. Um, and it's like that's yeah, that's kind of where you know things are going. But the thing is, is I don't think where things were 40 years ago was really all that beneficial for men. And I don't think where things are heading or where they will be 30 years from now are all that beneficial to women. And I don't think it should be a one gender, you know, benefit based upon whatever the, the market conditions is for availability of, of sexuality. I think if there's more education around 
understanding that men and women are very different, what those differences are, and how both parties can have their needs met. Like if the girl goes on that date and asks the guy to masturbate because it, turn, it, it turns her on whether it does or not just to say that, and the guy can experience orgasm without the girl feeling that she's sacrificed any part of herself, I think everybody wins. I think, I think the future is really going to be, unfortunately, the women just kind of being obligated. And it, it, kind of the, much of the same way that men are obligated to pay for dinner. I mean, they're not, but if they don't, they're not going to hear from the girl again. Mm-hmm. Women are kind of obligated to have sex with men. They're not, but if they don't, the guy's not going to call that, That's true. That's yeah. true. That is true because I've heard people say that they feel more pressure now as an adult to have sex than they did when they were younger. I've heard, pe- I've heard women say that. And and I also hear a lot of women complain that chivalry is dead. Like yeah, women m- killed it. Dave Chappelle said it. Chivalry is dead, and women killed it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you go to if you go to my bio website, which is pornographyexpert.com, you can see a lot of academic links. But scroll down to where it says like relevant satirical comedy, and look at the Dave Chappelle differences in men and women, and you can hear about the uh, the little chivalry argument about how how women killed it, <laughs> and uh, the. Um, the other thing that I thought was funny that Dave Chappelle said just on the, on the side tangent was he's like, you know, um, women dress all provocatively with really short shorts with their ass cheeks hanging out, really low cut tops, and then they get upset when they're sexualized. And somebody looks at them and says, wow, oh my God, I love your boobs. And, and then they get upset. It's like, why do you have your boobs on display and your butt on display if you're going to get upset? If you're drawing attention there, then you get upset that attention was drawn. And Dave Chappelle says, and they have a point. They don't have to be treated that way. But let me give you, you shouldn't assume that they're overly, overly sexual just because of the way they're dressed. And he's like, but let me give you an analogy. Assume you see a crime happening. And there's a guy who appears to be a police officer. He's got a badge, a suit, a gun, and a hat. Officer, officer, there's a bank being robbed. And he says, hey, hold on. What gives you the right to think I'm a police officer? <laughs> and like, well, maybe the fact that you have a badge, a gun... He doesn't have to be a police officer. He's a guy, and it could be Halloween, right? So, if you're a woman and you don't want to invite sexual suggestions, then don't wear your boobs hanging out. Wear long, baggy clothes, and you don't have to worry about that. Right. And there was another joke that they did on Saturday Night Live. It was for a jeans company called Balls Out Jeans, where guys they have little slits with their balls dangling out, and and you know. And women, you know, guys were like, don't you hate when you look at a girl's cleavage and she gets mad at you and says, my eyes are up here, ladies. So with the balls have jeans, girls will walk by and look at their balls and they would go, ladies, our eyes are up here. You know, like, <laughs> but they're only looking down there because your balls are hanging out, right? Like, for, if you Google, like, balls have jeans, Saturday Night Live, or on YouTube, you'll probably see it. It's like a, a spoof on that. But it makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you're, it, but I get that women want to display their assets, so to speak, because it increases their likelihood of getting a high-value mate, mm-hmm. but they don't want the low-value mates. In other words, they right. want to advertise that the doctors and the lawyers and the handsome, tall, confident, good-looking, personable men that come onto them, but they also get upset when the bomb that's unemployed that's short and weak. <laughs> Right. But attraction is attraction. If I offer free water, I can't say free water, but only to those that I like. Right. You know, to, to somebody else. Um, so, you know, the future of, of dating and relationships, unfortunately, is moving toward a male centered model. Um, but I don't necessarily think that it needs to. I mean, I think that women can negotiate not having sex. Uh, much in the same way that men negotiate not having the, to pay for huge dinners anymore. Now guys say, hey, I'm going to get Starbucks and buy a coffee. He's still buying something. Mm-hmm. He's just spending six bucks instead of 60 bucks. Right. Now in, in, now, in your book, you say that women should not be upset if their partner has a fling. Why is that? Because he's going to have a fling anyways. It has nothing to do with you. Guys cheat. I hate to break it to you. There's, that's all the research that's available in social science is men cheat. We cheat. I mean, it is what it is. So it's almost like saying, men, let's say that I, I find out I, I'm, a, I'm a completely averse to a girl having a period. If she has a period, I'm going to break up with her. I'm only going to date girls that don't have periods. So and let's just say this is the common uh, social norm, hypothetically. And everybody knows that women have periods. Mm-hmm. But guy says, no, if a girl tells me she doesn't have a period, I'm going to believe her. Okay, so meanwhile... The, the end of the month rolls around. It's like, hey, where's your girlfriend? Oh, she's at her fan. She's hanging out with her mom for the weekend. 
It's like, dude, don't you think it's kind of weird that every 30 days she always has something kind of going on? I think she's having a period. No, 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 she had to work late, you know, like, and all of a sudden the guy discovers the period and then he's all pissed off. He's like, oh my God, she lied to me. It's not that you had a period, it's that you lied about it. It's like, no, it's that you're not going to date the girl if she has the period. It's a hypothetical analogy, right? So right. the thing is, is all guys are going to cheat. So the thing is, is the guy who's honest and says, sorry, honey, I'm going to cheat. It's just how I am. The girl's going to be like, F you. Because this other guy is not going to cheat, or at least he tells me that he won't. Right. And he finds out that he cheated. It's not that he cheated, it's that he lied. It's like, well, he had to lie to get into the relationship, otherwise he's in the same group as the first guy. You know, so what I'm trying to tell girls is, it has nothing to do with you. Guys cheat. Uh, back to the restaurant. I love the Cheesecake Factory. It has a 30-page menu. I like the environment. I would franchise. I would make a business decision to franchise a Cheesecake Factory. I think it's a a good business model, okay? Now, just because I own the Cheesecake Factory and I invest 80 hours a week working there and I'm spending all my resources into that as if it's my wife, just because I have lunch at the Olive Garden for a little variety or difference doesn't mean I don't love the Cheesecake Factory or that I want to divest my Cheesecake Factory investment and franchise an Olive Garden. It doesn't mean that. It just means I want something different. So when a girl finds out that her husband cheats, she shouldn't get upset or take it personally. It has nothing to do with her. Her getting upset for the guy cheating is no different than the guy getting upset because the woman cuddled the baby that wasn't theirs. Oh my God, how could you cuddle another baby? But it was so cute. How could you do it? I want to know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or it's like women cuddle babies. That's, that's their maternal nature. That's what they do. Now, could you impose and mandate absolutely don't do it? Yeah, the girl probably really wants to cuddle the baby but isn't doing it for her husband's sake. And maybe when a husband isn't looking, she's going to cuddle him anyways and go, what the fuck does he care if I'm cuddling a baby? Right. <laughs> That's what guys think. We have sex with another girl. We're like, why does she care? It doesn't affect our relationship. I'm not going to leave her. I just want variety. Right. If all I can tell people on this claim is to just read as much of the evolutionary psychology literature as you can. There's plenty of research on chimpanzee and bonobo sexual behavior, which share 99% of our DNA. You know, it's just so funny that in in our moralistic society, we look at chips and bonobos, we're trying to understand intergroup conflict and teamwork and all this stuff. And when we try to look for sexual behavior, we jump to birds. <laughs> it's like, why? <laughs> when you look at chips and bonobos, it doesn't carry the model of monogamy by any means. And and the funny thing about birds is they're only monogamous for one mating season. So if you want to look at birds, then humans should get married and divorced every year so they can mate with a different female. But, you know, they, they, they leave that part out of it. But every mammal... Um, that's highly, like, when you look at, like, dolphins, chimps, and bonobos, those are all highly promiscuous species. I mean, if, if humans were not, um, or if humans were designed for monogamy, we would be the only uh, social, intelligent, non-tree-dwelling primate that, that basically is monogamous. That's just extremely unlikely, especially when you look at all the, all the data. I mean, it's just, read up some thoughts, and it'll make sense. <laughs> okay, definitely, definitely. Now, uh, what does, well, let me say this. You said that men are like Bluetooth and women are like Wi-Fi. Why, okay. why, why is that? So, so basically, Bluetooth says, men are like Bluetooth in the sense that he is connected to you while you're there. And when, you, when he leaves the range of where you are, he starts looking for other devices to connect to. That's how Bluetooth works. Mm. So like, Bluetooth, I go, I go from here, I go to another place, I'm searching for other devices. Women are like Wi-Fi in the sense that when you go to a, a place, a public place, and you look for Wi-Fi, you're going to see all the connections. But you're going to connect to the strongest one, to the one that's investing the most. So women see the 20 guys that want to have sex with them or court them, or whatever you want to call it, but they're going to connect to the one that's the most genuine, that's the strongest connection. Ooh, that that... Could be somewhere, right? So they see all the opportunities, but they're not going to jump on all of them. They're just going to jump on this, the one that they gauge as the strongest, most secure connection. And then, like Bluetooth, all we need is to be connected at all times. So we connect at home, and then we leave, now we connect to the one that would work. And then we travel, and we connect to the one in San Francisco. Like, we're, we, we're happy just to connect for the sake of connecting. Oh my gosh, that is a great, and that is that is a very great uh, point. So how can they be? How can they get on the same wavelength? By understanding each other. If you understand, like I understand. So okay, take my take. Let's take two extreme analogies. Girl A says she's going to go back to the nineteen fifties. I'm not going to have sex until I'm married, and you're going to take me out to dinner, and you're going to court me, and you're going to buy me stuff, and you're going to patiently wait. You're going to ask my father for marriage, and then we'll get married. No guy today would accept that. 
Yelp. And if you send it to a girl, you call up the girl, you know, you're on Match.com, and you email her, you're hot, are you willing to have sex with me first, and then we'll go out on a date. No girl will accept that. <laughs> right. So those are both equally unrealistic scenarios. So you kind of have this this sexual conflict negotiation that's happening. Is how can a guy spend as little time and resources as possible, and how can a girl garner as much genuine interest from a guy as possible, so that she knows that she's not just being used for sex. And there's this bargaining process that they now they kind of call it the three date rule, which I think is a little bit less. But here's what I say to a girl. I say, listen, here's how you here's how you get on the same wavelength. Did you say? I realize you're a girl and you want to get to know me and you really want to know me well and all this before we have sex. And you realize I'm a guy and I just want to get laid. Okay? Now, is the fact that I have to have sex with you? No. I could go out with you and have sex with, a, with, with the girl next door and that's fine. It's like I doesn't have the outlet. But I know you probably wouldn't like that, right? So how can we do something together that will allow me to have what I want, which is basically the orgasm to quench my hunger, so to speak, and to allow you to have what you want, which is to get to know me but not feel like you've sacrificed a part of you or made you feel neglectful or bad afterwards. And this is where I talk about where the guy says, hey, wouldn't it be hot if, you know, if the, if the girl is already comfortable kissing the guy, which most girls are if they like the guy, why doesn't she kiss him and let him masturbate while she's doing that to completion? That's, it's a very erotic experience. I've done it many times where you kiss a girl and you and you and you masturbate like you have you have her you feel you need, you use one hand to feel her hair and her butt and you feel her on your lips and you use your other hand to stuff stimulate. It's a great experience. Guy comes, everybody's happy, and then I say to the girl after, "That was great. Sucks for you, <laughs> but you're the one that didn't want to do it, right?" And then what happens is, you know, one or two dates later, she's like, "Fuck this. This guy's still getting his orgasm. I'm not getting anything." And then she wants to have sex. Right. So I think oftentimes women use sexuality as like a, as a bargaining tool for like getting more resources or more investment, you know, for either of time or money or whatever. But and when women realize that if the guy takes care of himself, she kind of loses some of that control. Then it becomes less about that control part and more about just when it, whenever she's ready. And then mm -hmm. and if she's and if she re realizes that the guy just you know masturbated and came with her, you know, she didn't do anything. Uh, I think she, she just feels more comfortable that she experienced that with the guy, and then she's more willing to want to have sex when she's ready on her terms. Um, and then she can take it in stride. Maybe the next time she they'll make out, and she'll jerk him off. You know what I mean? Right. And yeah. then maybe, maybe then she'll give him a poor job, or maybe like just 69. Like, you know, it doesn't have to jump right to penetration. You know, like, it's just whatever all the parties are comfortable with, but you have to communicate. I mean, mm -hmm. think about Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. It's all about communication, right? Like, like people just need to communicate. The guys need to have the balls to say, listen... I really like you, but I have needs. <laughs> I have to get off. And I realize that you have, you know, uh, this, I mean, does it make any sense? I mean, you meet a oh, guy, yes. you, you, meet, you meet a guy you like, and you're on a great date, and he's freaking horny because you look hot, and he's like, fuck, I guess I'm going to end the date late now because I want to go home and have sex because she's not going to do it. Now, you, you lose half your date. You could have had more, but he has to go home and jerk off. If you just do it together, let him jerk off, now you, you know, resume your date. He goes and he washes his hands and you continue to the beach or whatever you're going to do and everybody's happy. Right. It's no different than if, like, remember, assume that men and women have different food drives. Let's say that you're hungry for three meals a day. Okay, you want to have three meals a day, like most humans, and, and, and men, hypothetically, only have to eat once a week or whenever they feel like it, okay? And, and we get upset when you want to eat and we think it's a waste of time, right? So we're on a date and you're like, uh, I haven't eaten in six hours, can we eat something? And I'm like, oh, what a perv. Why is Marcy such a perv? Why does he have to eat all the time? Like, why can't she just, you know, like, she's such a perv. Like, and then we learn, oh, shit. Then the girls start learning, well, I better not ask about food. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, no, you say, listen, I realize you, Dave, may not be hungry, but I'm hungry. Do you mind if we just stop? You don't have to eat anything. You don't have to pay for anything. Let me buy my own meal just so I can quench this hunger that I have that you don't. Right? That way I don't have right. to eat for the rest of the day. It, I would be sadistic to say, no, you can't do that. Much in the same way that a woman would be sadistic to say, I realize that we're making out and you're hot and have a boner right now, but I'm sorry, you can't take care of that. <laughs> you know, sorry, and I'm not horny. It's like, no, go, you know, go rub it out. Go watch, you know what I mean? Like, who cares? Like, no, you're not asking her to do anything. Right. You know? And maybe she'll, maybe she can turn on and jump in and give the guy a hand job. Who knows? But what I mean is, is this is how you get on the same wavelength, is you have communications that... Women have to understand, just because they wouldn't have sex with a stranger doesn't mean men don't want to have sex with a stranger. Just because they don't want to have sex right away doesn't mean men don't want to have sex right away. Just because a man is ready to have sex right away doesn't mean the girl is. But you have to under... There's no... 
nobody, kids especially in high school, nobody is taught about evolutionary psychology. They don't understand different adaptive problems that men and women face and why we see things differently. Much in the same way that men see food like sex, they want to go from, just because they own a restaurant they love doesn't mean eating eating in another town is any different. Um, women see it like a job. If you have a job that pays great money and you have a great boss and you have a great commute and you love everybody you work with and somebody says, hey, you want to make an extra $5,000? Most girls are like, most people are like, no. I make 200 grand on my job. What's five grand? I don't care, right? They don't need it. So for women, unless there's something wrong with the job, aka wrong with the relationship, they're not looking for other sex partners unless they have that history of sexual abuse or emotional abuse, which is a whole other story. That goes that, that that's addressed in the book as well. So if, if you want to understand how guys think, most women like to travel, right? Right. And if I'm anthropomorphic, what city do you live in? Where do you live right now? Oh, I mean, um, I'm sorry, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, all right. So let's say I'm Pittsburgh and I'm a girl. I'm female Pittsburgh, okay, and you're a male resident of Pittsburgh. And you say, I want to go to L.A. this weekend. Now I'm Pittsburgh and I start, I start crying. What does L.A. have that I don't have? <laughs> I have an airport. I have parks. I have a lake. You know? Now if you say, well, L.A. has warm weather, that's like saying the girl's hotter. You know what I mean? Like, and then right. Then, hurting her feelings, you know, because maybe you can't afford to live in L.A., that's why you live in Pittsburgh, right? Not you, but whoever, right? Like, it's one of those things, and you know that just because you travel to L.A. doesn't mean you want to move out of Pittsburgh. It doesn't mean you want to sell your house and quit your job and leave all your friends. Like, there's a lot of value to Pittsburgh. You love Pittsburgh. You don't want to leave Pittsburgh. Right. But the trip to Boston doesn't change that. You know what right. I mean? So, so hooking up with some other girl on a trip, you know, that you're never going to see again. Maybe you met her at a conference. Like, it doesn't have anything to do with your marriage, your love for your wife. As a guy, from a male perspective. Right. Here's what a guy once told me, and I always remember this analogy, and I because I think it fits it to the T. He once told me, he said, it's like this. It's like a man has a car that he loves, that he has a, a sentimental attachment to. He loves this car. He wouldn't trade this car in for the world. But every now and then, every now and then, he may see another car that he wants to test drive and see how fast it goes and it looks nice. So he may park his car and go drive that car. And then when he's done testing it and when he's, you know, done seeing how it works and everything, he parks that and gets back into his normal car. True. The only, the only difference that I put in those distinctions is that driving a car isn't biological, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas eating food, I use the food analogy because people have to eat. Right. Right. It's fine. I mean, I like the analogy. I think it's it's accurate, but I think more fitting is the food analogy because people can understand the concept of being hungry. Right. Okay, so you get hungry. You it's a necessity. But in understanding that second difference between men and women, well, you know, it's, it's definitely an accurate analogy. But again, there, the only problem is there's, there isn't a biological underpinning there, and people don't get you know biologically change in their biochemistry if they haven't driven a car. Right. Like, you don't eat or you don't have sex. Or you don't. These types of things uh, are, are happening, right? And I know um, in Steve Harvey's books, um, "Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man," he talks about how the the need for sex for men is is very it's more stronger than it is for women. And but also he talks about the dating, I mean the waiting rule, the what is it, ninety days or something that he says in there. So oh, for women, well, yeah, because then you're gonna know the guy is generally interested. I mean, like that's the thing. It, it, Women never know who's generally interested. Right, that's true. Like, like the guy can be bullshitting all day long. Like, so what I tell girls is, listen, if the guy's spending time on you and he's spending resources with you, he likes you. And the thing is, is listen, if I go out with a girl and she doesn't give me anything, I'm not going to hang out with her. At least give me a hand job or let me listen. I can meet a girl; she's super cool. If we make out every night and I take care of myself and she doesn't do anything, I will wait a year. I don't care, but I have an outlet. You know what I mean? So right. I agree with what he's saying in the sense that. A lot of guys that just want to go around and, in other words, let's just say I had a girl I liked and I was doing that with, and there's another girl that I don't like, I just want to have sex with her, if all she's going to do is let me jerk off when we make out, I'm not going to hang out with her more than three days. So Steve Harvey's rule works there because she loses, the, the, the not interested guy will drop off, but if a guy's interested, he'll stick around for as long as it takes, provided he's not denied um, that opportunity to... For that, no, or he might just be having sex with another girl, right? With benefits until she's ready. So as long as she, but as long as the woman is cool with that, what a woman can't do is tell a guy, "I'm not going to have sex with you." And while I'm not having sex with you, you also can't have sex with another girl, right? Saying I'm not going to feed you, but you can't eat at another restaurant. It's like, well, I got to eat, so make up your mind. I mean, I want to eat with you, but if you're not going to eat with me, I got to eat somewhere else, or at least keep giving me bread until you're ready to feed me. Right, 
Right. So so you don't so so you don't think there's anything wrong with the waiting to have sex for ninety days? No, I think it's smart. If I was a woman, 